All right, welcome to A Growing Concern. I want to remind viewers that we're on every other week. Next program will be August 18th. And I think the next one after that won't be until, the, until September. But tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Afghanistan. Actually, we're going to talk a lot about Afghanistan. We have Professor Zahir Wahab with us, who was formerly with the Lewis and Clark College and currently with the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul. Uh, this is kind of a tradition. We do this every year. Uh, when Zahir comes to town, he gives various presentations all around town, and he's, uh, it's, it's very important to have uh, uh, eye-level reports on what's going on in Afghanistan because we're not getting that from our media. We're getting basically, for the most part, press reports from the government, it seems like to me anyway. And uh, we're, we're going to just jump right in this. Uh, so here, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jim. I really Thanks. appreciate it's good it, to be and, with you. and I'm really happy that you're able to do this every year and come on and talk about well, this. You have I'm any? happy to be alive and be back <laughs> here. So <laughs> that's true. Really happy to be here. And how many years have you been coming on and talking about this? Since, well, for see, ten years, maybe, or at least from the beginning, since 2002, actually. Because that's when I first I met you was when you were doing your talks around yes, town. Yes, yes. I remember when uh, the United States decided to. Uh, invade Afghanistan in October of 2001, uh, I uh, kept saying even then so not to, de to militarize the situation. Uh, I was arguing for, uh, you know, a criminal investigation. Uh, the 9-11 atrocity was essentially a criminal uh, act. As you can remember, there were 19 uh, hijackers. Uh, Mostly there were Saudis. no Afghans amongst them whatsoever. Uh, 17 of them Saudis and three or four of them from other countries. Uh, um, but the United States uh, decided to uh, uh, attack and invade uh, and then, of course, dislodge the Taliban from power. Uh, and then the rest, as they say, is history. So we have been talking about this for 16 years, Jim. And, you know, historians tell us that this is the longest U.S. war uh, in U.S. history. Uh, and it's amazing, and it doesn't look like it's going, going to end mm -hmm. anytime soon. Well, it's, uh, it's it is a, something that people really need to be concerned about uh, uh, and do something about it. Sure. You know, it is the longest war in what, 16 years, but at the same time, I forget what the statistics, but the United States has been pretty much at war for, what, 150 years at one, yeah. one place or another? Well, you know, people like Chomsky have said that uh, the U.S. foreign policy uh, essentially has been very much the same for the last 150, 200 years, and that is the purpose of the foreign policy really is to uh, secure uh, markets, uh, resources, uh, labor, uh, and uh, spread U.S. hegemony around the world. Uh, and this is precisely the reason now uh, why the U.S. is at war, directly or indirectly, in five or six different places, you know, Iraq, Syria, um, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, uh, and, um, you know, maybe uh, Iran indirectly. So uh, the, it seems like uh, in Afghanistan uh, there's no other purpose than uh, war itself. Uh, as you know, war is very profitable for uh, the military-industrial complex. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, weapons have to be made... Uh, Uniforms have to be made and sure. people have to be transported. So it keeps the campaign it's big uh, business for the corporations and also for the uh, for the campaign coffers of the of our Congress. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's all linked. You mm -hmm. know, it's really sort of like uh, an elite uh, uh, coalition of the military, industrial, intelligence, even the media. You mentioned the media. I'm sorry to say that the American media is really not serving the nation. Uh, and in the case of Afghanistan, there's a reason for that, for example, although some of the major networks like CNN, The New York Times, Washington Post, and some other papers may have uh, uh, permanent representatives, but the problem in Afghanistan this moment is that foreigners simply cannot leave their compounds. Uh, all foreigners, including us at the American University of Afghanistan, are essentially like prisoners, mm -hmm. self-imposed prisoners, because... Um, no foreigner is safe anywhere, whether you're a, a, military, a medical doctor or a, a CIA or a teacher or a journalist. And so uh, American journalists, like a lot of Western journalists, really have to rely on their Afghan stringers. Uh, and Afghans also uh, are afraid to go out into the battlefield. Uh, and so, you know, you get the very superficial 
um, coverage, and there's really no intelligent analysis, no critical analysis. If you really want to understand the Afghan situation, you have to sort of go to other media, the British press perhaps, Indian press, uh, and the Afghan press itself. Um, although every now and then the New York Times will have uh, a good article, like recently the, the Post and the New York Times had some pretty good articles. Uh, but the situation in Afghanistan is a catastrophe. I think it's a disaster for this country and a catastrophe for Afghanistan. It certainly is. You know, I was wondering, uh, I know that the, we, for some reason we blame the Taliban for what happened at the 9-11. Uh, I never, I don't really remember why we singled them out, but I, I was curious what the situation, economic or whatever, that was in Afghanistan just before we went in. I know that there was, the country might have been devastated with the war with with Russia, but I imagine that they were probably recovering. Well, or, or, um, or was it just a futile situation mm -hmm. with the Taliban in charge? Yes, yes. Well, as some people have said, uh, perhaps Afghanistan is cursed by geography. Uh, kind of like Israel. such a thing called <laughs> as the resource mm -hmm. curse in the curse of geography. Um, you know, uh, you might know this, that Afghanistan has always been sort of a place where uh, foreigners have come, empires. Mm -hmm. The Chinggis Khan, Timur Lane, Alexander, Alexander. Great, uh, the mm -hmm. British, the Afghans fought three wars with the British, and then the Russians, and now the Americans. Uh, uh, most recently, in, in our memory, for example, uh, the country has been sort of at war with itself or with uh, invaders for the last 40 years, almost 40 years. Uh, you know, millions of Afghans have been killed or died. Millions have been displaced internally and externally. Uh, the country's infrastructure is gone. Uh, its economy, its institutions, its culture, uh, you know, its political system, all have been damaged very, very deeply. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, the most recent history was that uh, there was a palace coup in Afghanistan in 1973, where one cousin overthrew the monarchy, uh, and uh, Daoud ruled for a couple of years, uh, and then he was overthrown and killed along with his entire family in 1978, April of 78, by the um, so-called People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the leftists, uh, communists, supported by uh, the then Soviet Union. They were in power and, of course, uh, killed a lot of people uh, because they were in a hurry to modernize the country. Uh, uh, and as soon as, of course, the communists took over in April of 1978, uh, Brzezinski, you may recall, uh, said to Carter that we have an opportunity now to give the Soviet Union its own Vietnam, uh, exactly his words. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the United States and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan got together then in 1978 quickly um, to form these militias, essentially some of the most fanatic, conservative, medieval uh, elements in Afghan society. Uh, they put them together, trained them, armed them, funded and, uh, you know, financed them and organized them and sent them back. And so there was a bloody, uh, you know, war between the so-called Mujahideen That's and the Soviet Samaki. Union and its puppet regime. Uh, you know, and there were uh, problems within the PDPA regime, you know, where three leaders were killed, uh, you know, or killed each other. Uh, and then the Mujahideen took over, of course, in, 19, um, in 1992. Uh, 1992 to... 1994, the Mujahideen were in power, and that's when Kabul was destroyed. The Mujahideen themselves, there were seven different factions that the United States and Saudi Arabia and Pakistan supported. Um, Inter-factional uh, fighting between the Mujahideen and uh, tens of thousands of people were killed. Kabul was destroyed pretty much, and the infrastructure was gone. Um, then the Taliban emerged. Uh, and I think uh, the saying now is that uh, the Taliban, like the Mujahideen, were also an American, Saudi, and Pakistani creation. Ah. Because the Mujahideen, uh, uh, they did so much damage that people turned against the Mujahideen, the population. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. wanted a new kind of uh, a puppet. And the Taliban were created through Pakistan. Uh, and, of course, the Taliban took over. Uh, in 1996, by 1996, they controlled the, most of the country uh, and from 96 to 2001. Uh, 
uh, and then 2001, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center. But at the time, remember, you may remember this uh, from other sources, that the decision really to invade Afghanistan uh, in 2001 was made well before the 9-11 um, uh, uh, tragedy. Uh, that the decision was made to uh, invade either Afghanistan or uh, Iraq. Uh, so, uh, so the United States invaded and the United States is still there. Uh, so today the United States has uh, eight and a half thousand uh, troops and maybe that many third country contractors uh, and you have about um, uh, you know, half a million Afghan national security forces. Uh, so um, the U.S. has been there, you know, this is the third presidency. Uh, President Bush started, of course, the war, and there were surges, big surges and many surges. Obama took over and he had two surges, so-called increase the level of troops. Uh, and then now we have President Trump, uh, and there's apparently a serious debate going on in Washington, what to do next mm -hmm. um, in um, Afghanistan. And some of what is leaking out to the press uh, is very, very interesting, which we can go into. Uh, mm -hmm. So essentially, that's the history. And when the United States was moving in in 2001, uh, you know, I visited uh, a little afterwards. Uh, there, is, there was essentially uh, really no economic infrastructure. Uh, very little education, little economic activity, uh, you know, the roads, the infrastructure, the factories were all damaged, uh, you know, by tens of years of, uh, of war. Uh, but there was one thing that the Taliban uh, could uh, uh, deliver, and that is um, security. Uh, there was no crime and criminality. Uh, of course, there was no development or modernization either. Uh, and now, since 2002, uh, you probably know this too, that the United States alone has spent $1 trillion on this war. Uh, and it has uh, given Afghanistan about $120 billion for development. Uh, but if you went to Afghanistan now, um, other than private entrepreneurship and private development in terms of apartments, you know, wedding halls and fancy homes, etc., there's very little public development work that is being done on infrastructural development by the Americans or by the, the Afghan government. So what you said is 120 million billion billion being spent, uh, which would leave 880 billion that that is uh, not that is. Well, you, you said that the 120 billion was spent for what? Given for uh, nation building, so nation called building. nation building. So there's like national eight, development, almost seven, seven times that much that's that's uh, being spent, and where's it going? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, P President Bush, when he was invading the country, was saying um, he's doing this one to end world terrorism, global terrorism, and you know how that is going. Uh, you know, it has increased terrorism a thousand times. That's just what I was going to say. It's going well the victims, for the terrorists. <laughs> and the majority of the victims of terrorism are Afghans. They're not Americans or Europeans or Japanese. They're Afghans. You know, every year about 3,500 Afghans get killed, civilians and 10,000 Afghan national security forces and, you know, countless number uh, maimed and so forth. So, uh, you know, President Bush was saying he wanted to end terrorism, uh, bring uh, peace, progress and prosperity to Afghanistan and liberate the women and end the narco industry mm -hmm. and, you know, stabilize the region. Essentially, uh, these were the reasons or... These are the bullet points. Uh, bullet points. Uh, but if you look at any one of those, um, uh, and there's nothing but failure. Uh, all efforts have failed. Uh, you know, as we said, you know, terrorism, uh, it goes on every day. And in Afghanistan, unfortunately, as I said, this happens almost on a daily basis. So if you go to Afghanistan now, you're not safe anywhere. You're not safe in this television studio, for example. You're not safe in places of worship, uh, not in the university classroom, not in your house not on your way to work, not in your workplaces. Even if you're watching a sports event, for example, you're not really safe and you don't feel safe because attacks have occurred, explosions, massive explosions have occurred in uh, any one of these events, any one of these places. So, and as I said, I think uh, the victims of terrorism, unfortunately, uh, are mostly Afghans and third world country people. You know, how many, how many 
uh, Americans have been killed, let's say, by terrorists, quote unquote, since 2001. Very few, hardly. We can't even remember. Not very many the at all. Same with you know, there were a couple of episodes in in London. Um, and if you look at uh, you know the economy again, uh, you know this is a country where half of the population live in poverty. If you took a plane and landed in Kabul, uh, you know this is what you will find out. Half of the population is hungry. Half is unemployed or underemployed. Uh, per capita income, average income is five hundred dollars. Um, uh, per year. And they uh, don't have electricity or running uh, water. Half of the people have electricity. Uh, you know, sh my wife Tahmina communicates with her family and uh, in Kabul itself uh, there's no regular electricity. Uh, half the people have no regular safe drinking water. Uh, you know, the country depends, uh, the government itself depends on uh, foreign aid for 70 percent of its uh, operating budget. So this is the economic situation. And all these years, uh, you know, if you travel around the country, uh, Americans have not really spent a single major uh, infrastructural project, like a dam or a farm or a factory or a cooling house or anything like that. So mm -hmm. this is what, uh, but at the same time, when you said, where did the money go? Uh, uh, I think the answer would be um, to go look at the uh, cigar reports, S-I-G-A-R. And this is the Special Inspector General for the Reconstruction of Afghanistan, uh, which is a, a congressional appointed uh, team. Uh, John Sopko, who is a, a very well-known lawyer uh, with 150 or so lawyers, accountants. And they have been there for more than 10 years tracking American money. And his most recent report was uh, to port number 36. Uh, he's saying most of that money that was to be spent on developing the country left the country through corruption, mismanagement, waste, uh, misspending, and contract rigging, and so forth. So a majority of the $120 billion was either misspent or stolen, both by the Afghans and also Afghan contractors and you know, government members, and by uh, international companies. Mm -hmm. well, then so if for example, if you go look at schools, half of the schools have no building. You know, most people have no access to health care, simply health care. Uh, you know, you look at people and people are desperate. You know, they, they look hungry, they look poor, and they look wretched. It, it seems to me that you really can't call what we're doing over there a failure if we're doing it deliberately. Uh, well, $120, billion, $120 yeah. billion for nation building and yeah. all the rest of that money, uh, it seemed like you would have to go out of your way not to help the people with some of that money. Yes, well. It would seem uh, like to me anyway. Yes, but the point is that you need a, a good people's government um, that will be accountable both to itself, uh, to the public, and to the foreign sponsors. But we, unfortunately, one of the things that I think the Americans have done is to uh, empower and put in place some of the worst elements in Afghan society. Uh, you know, these were mostly criminals, uh, although now the high-level governments are, some of them are, quote, technocrats, but we have a government which is not really accountable to anybody, uh, and we have a government which has no control, a government which is illegitimate completely because, remember, this government was put together by John Kerry uh, two years ago when uh, they had presidential elections, you know, uh, highly rigged, fraudulent elections. Uh, the first round was in April of 2014. Uh, that, you know, didn't result in anything. And there were two candidates. And then it went to a second round. Uh, and when that didn't also pan out, uh, and no results, no, uh, you know, winners or losers. <laughs> and, and when it looked like the country was on the verge of civil war, uh, John Kerry came and stitched this thing together in the American embassy and then, you know, said to one of them, uh, Dr. Ghani, you be the president, and Dr. Abdullah, you be the um, chief executive officer. And we'll pull the strings. Yeah, <laughs> and we, yeah, it was told. And that government from day one, you know, these people hate each other. They represent different ethnicities, different uh, ide ideology. I can't tell because they're all the same. But the government has been essentially busy sort of um, filling its pockets and putting its own people in place and bickering about positions, mm -hmm. you know, ministries, ambassadorships, governors, uh, generals, commanders, etc., etc. So you have a government which is referred to as a rentier state, 
which is really not, uh, and the people are disempowered. They're marginalized, just like here in some ways, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, so the people have no leverage. They have no influence on the government, uh, and the government doesn't have to account for where it spends its money, how it should spend the money, and what it should do, or what the priorities should be. Mm -hmm. And the foreigners who, you know, give these blank checks to the government uh, don't have to, uh, they don't seem to have the wherewithal or the freedom or uh, the opportunity to sort of go and see that, you know, uh, you asked for $10 million for this thing to be built, is it being built? Because foreigners can go, cannot go there and supervise the projects. And they can't keep track of the materials or anything. It's a massive failure, yeah. but it's, a, it's, as you said, it's a success in a way for uh, the thieves, the kleptocracy, whether they're Afghans, Afghan governments, or foreign contractors. Foreign. Mm -hmm. People made billions of dollars, and there's a new sort of an overreach in Afghanistan that you have never seen before. I mean, in Afghanistan, you can find consumer goods that you can find in Portland. And you do, people do cosmetic surgery when most people have no access to, say, aspirin. Mm -hmm. So you're saying there's, there's a segment of society and they probably live in a special part of Kabul? Yes, there are, the, like this so-called greenhouse. And the rich, but also most of these people have taken their money and their children out. They are there because they want to make more money, you know, take more money out. So um, you see homes and structures and buildings that you don't see in Portland. Uh, you know, roads have been blocked. You know, everyone has bodyguards. You know, you have these high walls, you know, blast wall that the rich and influential put around their houses. And when people complain about traffic jams and, you know, obstructions to go from point A to point B, the government and the municipality is in no position to tell these people to remove these blast walls because, you know, it's a public nuisance. So, uh, so that's the government. So it's not really a government, then. It's a, it's a puppet, it's, uh, yeah. really. Sort of a, a range. It's and a the government is happy to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all opportunists and you know thieves, essentially, and criminals. We have criminals, known, well-known criminals, in, who are actually by Human Rights Watch or the UN State Department, the U.S. State Department, uh, are. You know, we have, for example, uh, this warlord uh, Hikmatyar, who was just allowed with the UN and U.S. Uh, to return, but Hikmatyar. Uh, was on um, the U.S. State Department's uh, terrorist list. He could not come to this country. He now lives across from the university <laughs> with the full permission, you know, support of the United States. These are the kind of people, mm -hmm. you know, people who are, again, not fit in any way to govern, are empowered, and are running the country. And they're preparing their children. So when, you know, they're getting older and tired and so forth, and so they're, when they're gone, their children will take over. So there's no opportunity for honest, decent, competent people to run the country. Which is why you're involved in a, in a uh, university to try to, to try to train some people with some competency. Maybe well, not on the same level, but at least as engineers and, 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 and whatever can help to rebuild the country. We're trying. When I first uh, remember, when I first went to Afghanistan in early 2002, uh, quite a few expatriate Afghans came from all over the world, and quite a few foreigners, you know, who came. We really believed, Jim, then that we could build the country, that we could take this country in a different direction, that we could bring, you know, progress, democracy, prosperity, and peace, and those kind of things. So when I first went, and I had been going every year for the last 16 years, uh, in the first four or five years, there was hope. We really thought, you know, we were making progress. But then um, things began to change. Uh, sort of different mafias began to form. You know, the timber mafia, the human trafficking mafia, mm -hmm. the narcotics mafia, the weapons mafia, mm -hmm. the mining mafia, yeah. the, the water mafia, the land mafia, the power mafia, political power. They're all organized. They're, you have these syndicates, you know. With their lobbyists, probably. Yeah, and their people. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. more than lobbyists. They mm -hmm. will come and threaten you, say. So if there's a... A contract, say something needs to be built, and we're both bidding, uh, but I have the connection and I have the militia. So I will send somebody in the evening to you and say, withdraw your bid or else. Things like that happen all the time. So initially, we really were hopeful that we will, were building the country, but then, as I said before my eyes, you know, the country began to change the political system. So I went uh, into teaching. 
taught at Kabul University and Kabul Education University. Uh, and then for the last three years, I have been working with the um, American University of Afghanistan. We, a couple of us expatriates, founded this university uh, in 2006. I didn't know uh, that. In uh, 2006, uh, and uh, it now has about 1,000 regular and maybe 1,500 irregular part-time students. We offer two graduate uh, MA programs and four undergraduate degree programs. It's in English, of course. And our idea was that uh, we needed, Afghanistan needed a good model university. Uh, although there are literally 150 private and public institutions, but they're, uh, you know, of very low quality. And we thought we would build a, a quality model liberal arts institution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which believes in equity, freedom, pluralism, and academic freedom and so forth, which is what we're trying to do. And we're trying, we think, uh, you know, in our faculty are mostly Westerners, American and Westerners, foreigners. Uh, of the 35 regular faculty, about 20 have PhDs, uh, unheard of in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And we try to maintain, you know, certain standards. Um, you know, and if you are, if you are there, you know, it sort of looks and feels like a university. It has the ambience, uh, you mm -hmm. know, resources, good faculty, uh, internet, nice classrooms. Buildings. Buildings, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> and, and academic freedom. And this is why we were attacked about exactly a year ago, mm -hmm. where 15 of our faculty and students and guards were killed. Uh, and before that, two of our colleagues were kidnapped. They're still at large. Well, all the reasons why you said you were what you were trying to do is exactly what the Taliban or whatever the terrorists, the ones that are uh, in opposition to you, that's exactly what they don't want. So you're... you're Precisely. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, and it's interesting because initially uh, most people, whether they were in the government, uh, outside the government, public people, people really welcomed the international security forces, NATO and the Americans. Uh, and people were hopeful that these people would bring, finally, uh, you know, these foreigners will bring peace, prosperity, progress, et cetera, et cetera. But now um, a lot of people uh, outright, they dislike foreigners, especially Americans, or are very suspicious and skeptical. And so the American University, uh, to a lot of people who are now convinced that the Americans are there not to develop Afghanistan or free Afghans, but America is there pursuing its own agenda. Uh, and so there's this uh, tremendous dislike um, uh, at all things American. Uh, and so, and also some people think that the American university is maybe just a, uh, an up outpost for spies, uh, you know, that we're proselytizing people maybe, mm. or we're doing the work of the American government or Washington. We're not. You know, it's a private, non-profit, non-denominational university. We have our own board of uh, trustees. Uh, you know, it's a... a it's completely self-governed. Um, we do get our funding 70% from USAID, but it's contingent on performances. So, uh, so because of because we're American, uh, people don't quite trust us. And, uh, and as I was saying before the show, so. <laughs> we're sort of it's like a prison. Essentially, it's like a vast, big prison because it has two thick blast walls. These blast walls all around us. So you can't, if you're on campus, you can't see the outside. You know, it's, you have these thick blast walls. I think this might be maybe 15 feet. Uh, you know, and then uh, watchtowers, snipers, guards, g uh, cameras, uh, you know, sirens, um, dogs, you know, uh, biometrics, scanners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Essentially, it's like a, a prison. And, uh, we expatriates are not allowed to leave the campus except mm -hmm. for emergency reasons. Sounds a little like Palestine and Israel. Where yes. You, where you have, you got checkpoints and all. We, we, everywhere, yeah. If you mm -hmm. go in and out, whoever you are, uh, the car, you know, the police, the, the, the dogs come and sniff the car. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, as I said, if and when we are allowed to leave the campus, because the campus has sort of become uh, self-sufficient. So we have the, the barber come into campus, mm -hmm. the dry cleaner, you know, the baker, the little store, the, <coughs> the tailor, 
Um, so it's like a self-sufficient, self self-governing self uh, place. Well, that could the, be an avenue that the terrorists <coughs> could come in too, as a tailor or a or a, a laundromat. So that 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 must be kind of a. a it's a very hard. Fright, frightening uh, you know, situation. we live. Uh, yeah, we there's a faculty apartment, for example. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, when you're in the apartment, you draw the curtains. You don't open the curtains because you could be seen from outside because there's still the possibility of being rocketed from sure. off campus. Well, that's, that's pretty scary. You know, from what you were talking about earlier, uh, give your voice a second here, you've talked a little bit about what you want to do with that university, but, but the people that come to that university to, to learn had to have gained some kind of uh, instruction or some kind of education level before that, especially since they have to be able to speak, speak English in order to because your, your yes. studies are in English, yes. so there there are there are other levels below the uh, the university where at least some children are learning. Yes, well, English is taught. Uh, it's the most common language taught in schools, ah, okay. beginning in seventh grade. <clears throat> but you need good instructors and good material. But people manage. Some people manage to learn enough to enter the university, and then we do our own training. Uh, essentially, we get two kinds of students. One, uh, high school graduates who are very smart but poor, and they're on full scholarship. <clears throat> so we have, for example, a dormitory for girls, and we're the only university that has students from every province, every one of the 34 provinces, because we send our admissions people and say, go find talented boys and girls, and we will find a way to support them. And then you get students who are quite rich and are paying their own way. And this is a university, you know, where yearly um, expenses are about $5,500. That is 11 times the average income of the average Afghan. So it's an expensive university. But because the payoffs uh, to uh, the university, graduation from the American University, are quite good uh, because our, our graduates are quite competitive. Uh, you know, they learn the most up-to-date things in their fields. Uh, they master the English language quite well. You know, they're um, good in IT and uh, communication technology. Mm -hmm. So they're very competitive in terms of uh, going to graduate school or getting jobs or going abroad. That was going to be <coughs> my next question, which you pretty much already covered. Is this, they go through all this in order to go to school. Is there, you know, since there's very little uh, infrastructure and there's so much graft and corruption, is there any place that they can go and utilize that? Well, that it's education. a drop in, Apparently it's, there you is. Know, it's a drop, uh, uh, not just in a bucket, but a drop in a river. As I said, unfortunately, corruption has so infected the society that it's part of the DNA now. Uh, I mean, this is what uh, Cigar, uh, that I referred to earlier in Sopco, has been saying and warning that uh, the massive endemic corruption could undo everything the Americans have done so far. Um, everyone would tell you that. And Sapko is on the ground, you know, he's there all the time and, you know, he investigates places. So, for example, in the military, uh, you have generals uh, who are, uh, you know, through nepotism, appointed through nepotism. Uh, you have uh, expenses uh, without any reason. You have salaries paid uh, where there are no soldiers or police, for example. Mm. Uh, you're charged the cost of fuel where the food fuel was sell, sold in the uh, black market. Uh, you know, weapons disappear, jeeps disappear, you know, things disappear like that. Uh, and so the corruption, unfortunately, is, is endemic. Uh, you can hardly go any place, especially dealing with government, uh, if you don't bribe somebody or if you don't know somebody, it's impossible to get anything done. And what this does, of course, is uh, create enormous or deepen antagonism toward the government and turn people away from the government toward the opposition. So a lot of people in the countryside, for example, they settled their disputes uh, through the Taliban courts and not through the government because there's no corruption in the Taliban courts. It's, their decisions are quick, they're non-corrupt, and they're fair. But if you go to the government, a small thing can go get, take forever. You know, and again, if you don't pay somebody mm. off, mm. it was estimated that Afghans paid about two and a half billion dollars in bribes 
last year, two and a half billion dollars. Uh, this is a country with the $16 billion GDP. So that's the, that's the, the people of Afghanistan paid those bribes. Yes, to the, to the, to, to the government. To the people of Afghanistan, <laughs> to the government. <laughs> to the government. Uh, and the point is that, you know, foreigners know this. You know, of course, these, the ambassadors, the embassies know exactly uh, what's what and who is who and who does what. Uh, but they hardly ever speak up against this or say, you know, don't do this. Uh, this is not why we put you in power. This is not why we're risking our lives or, you know, spending all this money. You need to govern properly. You need to behave like a government. But they don't say anything. They turn the other way. Mm -hmm. Which is to say, again, creating public antagonism. I mean, all these realities on the ground, whether it's corruption, whether it's nepotism, for example, whether it's uh, poor governance, you know, uh, whether it's the foreigners, you know, um, uh, abusing people in their privileges. Uh, it uh, creates antagonism amongst the population, and it turns people away from the government toward the, uh, the insurgents. Mm -hmm. Hence, you know, right now, if you go there, half of the, gov the country is governed by the insurgents. You know, half the population in the territory are controlled by the insurgents. And the insurgents aren't just one group of insurgents. They're basically, you thought, three or four different uh, well, three or 20, four diff 20 different groups? Are, they think there are 20 different um, insurgent groups, as I said oh my before, that you have these different mafias. So you have the drug mafia, which may or may not be related to the Taliban. Uh, and you have Daesh now, you know, these ISIS people uh, who um, came mysteriously, appeared you know, from Iraq and Syria. And the interesting question is, uh, you know, there are several countries between Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq, and how these people got through. Uh, and there's an answer, uh, and we can talk about that, because uh, many Afghans now believe that, uh, you know, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, and the Qaeda, uh, and now the ISIS are all American projects. Uh, that these essentially... Uh, that terrorism is created. This is what people believe. That terrorism, quote unquote, is sort of created, and terrorists are created by the United States. So then the United States can invite itself uh, and, mm -hmm. and stay there. Uh, in, in, in the case of Afghanistan, because of its uh, geographic location, people think that the United States essentially wants to uh, establish hegemony in Afghanistan, but also to destabilize using Afghanistan as a base and destabilize China and Russia and Iran. Uh, and there seems to be quite a bit of evidence because the insurgency is sort of moving north. It used to be in the south and southeast, but now it's in uh, the northern part of the country. That is, say, getting closer to Central Asia and also through, um, through China. And China, Russia, and Iran are very concerned. Remember, initially, all these three countries were supportive of the U.S. NATO invasion in Afghanistan, but now all three of them oppose this because they see themselves uh, threatened by the Ameri indirect uh, proxy American sure. um, they, shenanigans. They, they see what the real agenda, the real agenda was. It seems. So it that, would seem. Well, you know, it's no such thing that they say as a self-perpetuating machine, but it seems to me that if <coughs> the United States has created these terrorists and then, there, then the United States goes in there and, and fights them, creating more terrorists. It seems like that. Which is just seems to be, it just keeps going. Well, if you look at the, you know, the Mujahideen, as I said, it's a matter of record now that it, they were put together uh, very quickly by the Qatar administration and with a lot of help from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Uh, um, and then they were used and used quite effectively um, against the Soviet Union. And then when the Mujahideen uh, sort of uh, the relationship sort of soured uh, the, the United States created in, through Pakistan. Pakistan has been meddling in Afghan affairs for decades and decades because of the dispute over the border, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it has a long border. Uh, and, of course, Pakistan and the United States are very close allies. Uh, and then Pakistan, the U.S., and Saudi Arabia are very, very close. In other words, Pakistan couldn't and wouldn't do anything without the full knowledge and support of the, the United States. So if we, so that's the history of, say, the Taliban in Afghanistan. They were created somebody else. These are not indigenous people. Uh, 
mm-hmm. although they are, most of them are Afghans, but now you have, you know, international Taliban uh, who have mostly joined the ISIS because the Taliban still have a, a domestic agenda. That is to say, they claim that they don't want uh, foreigners and they're working against this Afghan government, which is, you know, um, a, a stooge or a, buff, um, a puppet of the, the, the United States. But ISIS has an international global agenda. They want to create an the, Islamic the caliphate. Uh, caliphate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you look at ISIS, when the United States invaded Iraq uh, and uh, pretty much it destroyed Iraq, and this, Iraq is gone, you know, uh, uh, and put the Shiites, which is a minority in Iraq, in power, the Shiites began to massacre Sunnis, including the army, Saddam Hussein's army, which was essentially a Sunni army. And that's when the Sunnis in Iraq, both the, from the army and from the civilian population who were fed up with the Shiite brutality, uh, formed this thing called ISIS. You know, and that's the growth of the, the, the birth of ISIS or Qaeda, and, and not Qaeda, but uh, Daesh. Uh, and so then they went to Syria, you know, and, and in Syria we might say that the United States uh, works with terrorists. They, they, the U.S. supports those terrorists who are against the Assad regime. Uh, mm-hmm. So there, it's very clear. The whole world knows this <laughs> on television that the United States work. <laughs> mm-hmm. In other words, the U.S. would work. There are good terrorists and bad terrorists. So if the terrorists work with us and for us, they're good. Uh, you know, um, uh, like someone was saying, I think it was one of the U.S. presidents saying about Somoza, remember? That yes, I, I know he's a son Somoza. of a bitch, but he's our he's son, our of, a son of a bitch. Yeah. So these are terrorists, but they're our terrorists. They're good terrorists. Mm-hmm. But those who work against us are bad terrorists, and we should go after them. So in Afghanistan, for example, the fighting, and right now there's fighting going on in 22 of the 34 states. Sometimes the U.S. forces, the Afghan forces and Taliban just live very a few yards from each other, but there's no fighting. Then from time to time, this fighting, and then there's no fighting, you know. It's very, very curious, which is to say the United States at one point in, say, from t- 29 to 2013, it had more than 100,000 troops, remember, from NATO, the U.S.? Sure. Yeah. And about 100,000 contractors, third country contractors. And you had a quarter of a million Afghan national security forces. In other words, for, say, from 2008 to 2013, uh, there were half a million forces in Afghanistan having the most modern equipment could not beat, say, 10,000 Talibs. It sounds a little strange, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, I think if, right. if the U.S. wanted to eliminate, that they could just eliminate every one of them. Mm-hmm. Not a single one could be left. Why, is, why are they left? And why do they flourish? You know, why do they increase their uh, you know, territory control, their population control? Uh, and the strength of the insurgency. That's really not a question. <laughs> yeah, it's an answer. So yeah, you know, I know that's an answer. Yes. You know, I just, think it'll be difficult mm-hmm. for a lot of our listeners to accept this. That the U.S. might have something to do with creating trouble, so that then it can go in quote, solve the problem. Mm-hmm. We could even do a half step there. People think that we went into that country in order to uh, stop the flow of opiate and drugs, but at the same time, we are actively working with those drug lords. Yes. So we can work we with the, we can work with the drug lords, which is diametrically opposed to one of the reasons why we went in there. It's not that much of a stretch to, to believe that we're yes. working with the terrorists. Yes. Which is why we went in there. Right. I mean, well, that, that, that know, follows the narcotics. Uh, you know, this is one of the the biggest tragedies of that country in this war, sort of an offshoot. But when there is insecurity, and when there's no government control, and when people are desperate, they will do whatever it takes to survive. So Afghanistan has been suffering a drought, you know, instability and poor governance. Hence, you know, the drug production. And uh, it's almost now common in all of the 34 provinces. It used to be limited to the southeast, southwest of the country, Herat, Ilmand, uh, Kandahar. But now it's all over the country. You're talking the farmers have no other choice. Right. They have, you know, somehow make... But also... And now, both the local and international drug mafia are in. Although the U.S. has spent $8 billion to eradicate the drug, but this year, for example, the pro- drug production has been the highest 
in the last, say, 15. Every year, drug production, drug trafficking, you know, drug processing, and drug use in the country increases. So one of the biggest tragedies that I said was that you have about 3 million Afghans now using drugs, and about 1.5 million are deeply addicted. You know, you have whole families addicted to drugs, men, women, and children. You have old uh -huh. people, young people, men and women. You have good people, you have bad people. You know, this is a, a monumental problem. Like, like opium in China. Yes, uh, but the, the thing is, you know, uh, I think drug, it's sort of a, the law of supply and demand. You know, there's drug production because there's a demand for it. The, the farmers need it to make a living. The local, you know, intermediaries need it to make some money. The local mafia needs it to make more money. And the international mafia needs it to be make billions and billions mm -hmm. of dollars. And, you know, uh, Westerners need drugs. So, uh, you know, then Afghanistan is a very convenient place to produce drugs. It, no one is serious about this, so why about is, the elimination of drugs. So why is, the, why is the American government and the army in cahoots with the with the uh, warlords. Yeah, because the, some of those warlords are known. I mean, they're known to have been involved in drugs. Some of the government officials at the very highest levels, you know, um, vice presidents, uh, you know, ministers, governors, uh, commanders, generals, are known to be involved because you look at their what the, their wealth. There's no other explanation other than that they're involved in you know, uh, drug, um, mm -hmm. drugs, and also the mining. And there are other kinds of mafia, you know, there's uh, timber, land, uh, weapons, uh, human trafficking, and so forth. Uh, but again, if the West is interested in serious about really uh, eliminating the uh, scourge of drugs, uh, it should try to do something about the demand uh, in Western nations uh, so that people can grow something else and not drugs. But sure. this is not being done. You know, it's not addressed here in Portland. Well, just making it illegal just makes people want to use it. You That's know, right. so just, just coming down hard on it, saying making yeah. it against the law it doesn't yes. work. Yes, and those warlords, uh, you know, uh, again, the U.S., unfortunately, the U.S. foreign policy has no morals and no ethical principles. It would work with anybody That's a good who point. works. Uh, so if a drug lord or a warlord or a criminal or a butcher or a corrupt person is useful, uh, for you, they, it, he is acceptable, uh, you know, and, and those are the kind of people that the United States, this is the damage, the structural political damage done by the West in Afghanistan is, again, to bring and in place and empower some of the worst elements in Afghan society. And these people are very entrenched in the system. They have private armies, you know, people have private prisons. You know, people get away with murder, literally. People, there's a shadow government, which is not even shadowy, it's rather obvious. There are people in the government who are against the government, you know. The public has no control. You, the common people cannot do anything about this. And there's really no place for decent people in the government. This is the damage, the real damage. Mm. Uh, because you wonder, you know, I mean, the American University of Afghanistan can try, we can try, you know, but we produce maybe 150 graduates per year. Uh, and you're talking about a country of 34 million people and, mm -hmm. you know, a country that has been deeply, deeply damaged. You call it the shadow government, but I've seen a lot of allusions to something called the uh, deep state over here. Yes, yes. The same thing. Yes, yes. Here Might be some of the same people. Uh, here know. is the corporate, well, they are connected. So, for example, mm -hmm. the talk in Washington now is, uh, you know, some of the people are getting impatient uh, with the Trump administration is to uh, make a decision about Afghanistan. Uh, the serious talk now is that the Trump administration is very seriously considering outsourcing the war to Blackwater and DynCorp and, uh, and American Elements. It's a, a multinational corporation. Mm -hmm. We all know about Blackwater. Sure. Uh, you know, it was in the news today, actually, the butchery that it did in Iraq. Uh, you I know, didn't see that. Blackwater has been uh, in Afghanistan from day one because they're sort of the paramilitary. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. they do the work of the militaries. But now, one of the ideas is uh, in Prince, Eric Prince, who is the head of the Blackwater. And the brother of our... The brother of the Secretary of Education. Right. 
Uh, so that sort of gives you an idea where they're coming from ideologically and how much affinity they have with the Trump in tr administration. Mm -hmm. So Prince had an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago saying uh, the United States should um, appoint a, an American viceroy and uh, privatize the war and run the Afghanistan. This is a Wall Street article. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is serious discussion now uh, because the, the general, the war is not being won. You know, General Nicholson, who is the commander of the forces in Afghanistan and Secretary uh, of Defense, Madison, you know, the National Security Advisor and, uh, you know, Tillerson, all these people are saying uh, the Afghan war is not winnable. Uh, we need to find political solutions. And in fact, the, what is in the news today is that Trump is very mad with General Nicholson, mm -hmm. uh, the American commander, and is thinking about firing him for not winning the war. Not winning the war. But the war is not winnable, and maybe the war was not meant to be won. You know, it was to be a stalemate from the beginning so that it um, provides an alibi for the American presence in Afghanistan. So it sounds to me like the, the, uh, the Trump administration just wants to give up all their pretense and just become the main warlord themselves. Yes, yes, and it's again, you know, how war becomes an enterprise. It's like an economic enterprise. So, you know, Eric Prince, it's, uh, you know, he's, he's running an economic enterprise. You know, security is big business. It's a global business, you know, multi, multi-billion dollar business. Sure. And if you can turn the whole war to him, just that, imagine <laughs> what this will do, what it says about the Pentagon and our uh, professional military, for example. Also, what it means for war is a way to profit. So war becomes an economic you know, enterprise. Sure, if, if, you, uh, can create the if you can create terrorism, then yes. you can create people like Prince who yes. fights terrorism and yeah. provides security. And the government, so you, you and I, <laughs> the taxpayers, would keep paying. I'm paying for both sides. Yes, yes. So, and that's, so that's, we pay the government, <laughs> the government collect from the American public mm -hmm. the money that should have been spent here on schools, you know, health care, roads, bridges, infrastructure, you know, employment, etc. you know. That money is gone to the accounts of the people like Dyncourt and uh, Blackwater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm hoping we're giving viewers out there an idea of the real dynamics that are going on on this planet. But we got five minutes left, and I think that uh, everything we've been talking about so far can be brought down to, to human rights and, yeah. uh, and, and social justice. But one we haven't mentioned is one of the main reasons we went in there. And was, I think mm -hmm. one of the main reasons that they said we needed to go into Afghanistan was because of the way women were treated. Yes. And it, it, as, as the drugs and all the different things we went in there for were supposedly a failure at, have we done any better with, yeah. with the women's rights? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I can answer um, uh, that question. Uh, I would you say... Can, oh, you can answer through her, through, yes. through her eyes uh, there. Women, there was an interesting article uh, that someone sent me in The Guardian, actually yesterday. And it starts in Helmand, and it starts with a woman uh, who, who had shot herself or was shot in the head. Uh, and like that Malala. Uh, yes. Uh, well, this woman was uh, about in a week, she was to have her arranged wedding, a young woman who was married to someone off. So I think if you, of course, uh, there's a big difference between the conditions of women now and, say, 2001 or 2000 and, or 1996. Um, because women then were almost like non-existent. They had a, they were a subterranean existence. Uh, very few of them in school, for example. Uh, hardly anyone worked outside. Probably couldn't women drive. Women were confined, mm -hmm. yes. No driving. You still, that's still very rare in Afghanistan. But today, if you were, again, took a plane and landed in Afghanistan, you know, 39, 40% of the school children, first grade to 12th grade, are women. Uh, about 20% of the university students are women. Uh, about 15% of the university professors are women. Uh, my wife, Tahmina, is a university professor. Uh, you see in the cities, you see women going to school, going to work, uh, government oh. work. Uh, in the cities, for example, about 70% of the teachers are women. Uh, women can travel more or less now outside the country to study, or etc. But no woman can live alone in Afghanistan. It's a risk, and she's not allowed. It's, it's not against the law. It's just a risk. It's against the culture. Culture. Uh, women do not choose their own uh, husband. 
about 75% of the women are still married off when they're too young, were under the legal age. Uh, in the countryside, women still live, labor, and die like they did in the Middle Ages. In the cities, life has improved a little bit because women have advocacy groups in their human rights organizations, women rights organizations. Uh, but women still have a long way to go. You see almost hardly any women driver uh, in any of the cities in Afghanistan. So that's women. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they lack health care, they lack political voice, uh, inheritance rights, uh, you know, pay, mm -hmm. uh, equity, working conditions, freedoms. Freedoms, women's freedoms mm -hmm. are still very, very sure. limited. And maternal mor mortality, you know, uh, mother's death and childbirth, these are still very, very common problems. Well, it seems to me that women don't have a long way to go. Patriarchy has a long way to go. Yes, well, uh, women's problems are a men's problem, of course. Uh, and, you know, there's, there are very few organizations working on this, on equity, you know, equal rights, human rights, you know, human dignity, uh, you know, economic well-being, uh, etc. cetera. Um, this is a country, again, unfortunately, the focus has been on fighting. Uh, instead of, say, building uh, in development. And that's why there has been very little development. And uh, in the meantime, you know, uh, some 3,000 Americans killed, 20,000 maimed, a trillion dollar wasted. And, you know, people estimate that maybe between 200,000 and a million Afghans have been killed in the last 16 years. A million Afghans. And again, two million have been displaced internally people living out in the open with nothing, you know, other than open skies. And it, that country gets cold, that country gets hot. It gets cold and hot, yes. So yes. we're down to about a minute and a half, and we can go to any direction in this. Yeah. How do you want to finish this off? Well, I think the important thing is that the United States, the American citizens should um, behave responsibly and intelligently. Good one. Yeah. And like world citizens. Uh, our trust, our moral capital, our money, are being squandered and wasted. Uh, we keep going around the world destroying countries one at a time. Uh, and we're spending a lot of lives and, and treasure. And Americans need to put an end to this. We need genuine democracy here. We need equality and freedom and opportunity and democracy here uh, so that we can be a model for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't be bullying people and invading countries uh, for no reason. Uh, other than, let's say, ideological or vulgar or economic uh, uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. That's how it should end. Uh, people behaving responsibly and intelligently and ethically. And that, that, is, that is something that every country pretends that they're doing. And, and, try, and, and, well, and our corporate media, we have, that's 20 yeah. seconds, or our corporate yes. media tries to pretend that, that yeah, we're and doing. And people need to support alternative media. People need to support people's media, you know, and people need to hold the press. Uh, that should serve us. The education system should function better. You know, we need to hold our government. Okay. In other words, perfect America first so that it can be a model for the rest of the world. All uh, right. Don't just send, you know, uh, troops uh, in drones abroad. That's very well put. I guess we're <laughs> done for now. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back in two weeks.